Um, let's get started, everyone. So there's a few announcements up on the slides. Um, I also posted on EdSTEM just the schedule for the next month. Um, we're going to be sort of, there's going to be a few more virtual lectures than there have been. Um, and I'll try to do reminders so no one shows up here when no one's here. Um, but sort of the most immediate one is there is no lecture, either physical or virtual, on Monday. Um, we'll make that up with sort of an, an, a non-traditional guest lecture time, um, sort of the speakers in the West Coast. So doesn't want to wake up at 6 a.m. Um, and so that'll be in early November. Um, and then next Wednesday will be um, a remote lecture. I'll be on the West Coast since I'll be waking up at 6 a.m. Um, and then, so no office hours today. Um, Joe is still going to have his office hours this Friday. There is no homework that's going to be released by then. So like go there if you all want to talk like, you know, want just like generic programming help. Um, especially uh, this will be a good time to, you know, at a slower pace, get uh, sort of get help on the homework that was just due or sort of thoughts on the homework that was just due because a lot of that is going to come back uh, for the class project. And it's going to come back in a way that's more complicated and harder. So um, especially if homework three was challenging and there's like a part, some parts that y'all want to understand better, um, this week, Joe's office hours are probably a good time to go. Um, and then, yeah, so related to that, homework four, I'll release the next week. And we'll also release projects, one in parts, sort of at least part one, hopefully in the next week and a half or so as well. Any questions about announcements? Okay, so let's get. Okay, so today is gonna be the last lecture in, um, in the pricing module. And we're, it's gonna be mostly conceptual, trying to bring all the pieces together and talking about how um, dynamic pricing and to some extent personalized pricing is done in ride hailing. And so the class will be fairly ride hailing specific, but a lot of these lessons apply to um, sort of online marketplaces in general and algorithmic pricing in general as well. Um, it's just that for a variety of reasons, uh, online uh, ride hailing has been the place with probably the most innovation in algorithmic pricing in the last five, six years. And that there's like teams of like hundreds of data scientists um, working on sort of algorithmic pricing and various aspects of it, demand modeling um, for, for, for like five, six, seven years now. And so um, this is probably um, the, the, the cutting edge of bringing algorithmic tools to doing pricing in real time. Okay, so what makes ride hailing marketplaces special, um, or at least like, you know, a much harder problem than uh, maybe historical, you know, a grocery store just post prices. And the key challenge, the key challenge is that demand is fluctuating quite substantially on these marketplaces. And like when I say that, I mean both like on the order of weeks. So this plot is actually from public data. It's from the Wright Austin marketplace, um, which is like a like a third, you know, an Uber Lyft competitor that grew up in Austin after Uber and Lyft left the city. And Oh, I think there might be automated timings that are going to be annoying. Okay, uh, so so sort of what you can see here is that sort of each of these spikes is the weak pattern in Wright Austin. So um, let me turn those timings off. I'm going to be very annoyed by them throughout. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, yeah, so 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 each of these spikes is sort of like the weekly pattern where uh, Ride Austin sees far more traffic on the weekends than they do on the weekdays. Um, so like each of these spikes is like Friday through Sunday, Friday through Saturday night. And then, you know, it dies down during the week. And this is like, you know, it triples in traffic over the weekend. And then um, South by Southwest came into town 
And so they sell like an extended peak for like about a week and a half or so, especially over that weekend. Um, but it's not just like fluctuating substantially across weeks. It's also fluctuating quite substantially within a day. So now instead of over three months, this is um, the, like a proxy of demand, the, the surge factor, which is um, over a three-day period. And so you see even on a three-day period, and then I sort of did the average surge factor every 10 minutes using this data set. And so you see like even within an hour, um, surge is fluctuating quite substantially, demand is fluctuating quite substantially. And it's like partially predictable, like, you know, like if you like map these to times of the day, there's gonna be rush hours, but then there's also spikes that are less predictable. Um, and then not only is there time um, fluctuation, there's quite a bit of spatial fluctuation. And so this is a plot for a, like a, a, the surge heat map or the demand heat map um, in San Francisco on Uber um, on some random day. And so I don't know how much, of, how much, how many of y'all know San Francisco geography, but you know, there's sort of like in, in like the red indicates high demand and then yellow is slightly lower demand. And then um, sort of the uncolored parts are the least demand, right? And so uh, they need to be able to do pricing that takes into account this like quite substantial demand fluctuation. And it's demand fluctuation, as I'll get into a little bit, that's like hard to predict. And so you really need to do real time pricing as opposed to just like saying every day at 6 p.m. prices are gonna be higher in this part of the city. And then the goal of pricing or surge pricing is to try to match this uh, the demand with the supply. And so what do I mean by that? Um, sort of, you know, there, I apologize, some of these, um, some of these slides are gonna be very, um, what's the word? They, they, they come from someone at Uber. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're sort of, they're, they're gonna make strong claims like, you know, it makes, it's efficient and reliable and blah, blah, blah. You know, those are not necessarily my views. Um, good question. So the, so the question is, is does uh, surge pricing have floors or ceilings? Um, so everything I'm gonna say in today's lecture is from public information. I'm not gonna say anything that I may know or may not know privately. Um, so I do not know the answer to that question. Okay. Um, yeah, I do, I do not know what's publicly sort of said about floors and ceilings. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so, so the goal of surge pricing is to um, create an efficient and reliable marketplace. And what does that mean? So let's suppose you just have two drivers in this neighborhood at this point in time, and you have more than two riders. Then uh, the goal of surge, at least in the most naive sense, is to just allocate the, 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 the rides to the people who value the rides the most, right? So if there's three people with valuation seven, six, and five dollars, you want to you know, try to allocate the, the rides to people who value at seven and six dollars. And you know, so for those of you um, who've taken economics courses, this is like you know, a standard, you want to price at a point where the, the demand meets the supply, right? So as you, as you increase the price, there's gonna be fewer and fewer people demanding a trip at that price. And as you, and I'll get into this in a little bit, ideally, as you increase the price, there's also more and more supply that comes in, right? There's more and more drivers who are willing to drive at that place and time at, the, at that given price because they get paid more. And um, so there, this is, the, the, there's a lot more complications that go on in ride hailing than this, like, you know, this supply demand curve, but this is like a good, like first order thing to understand what's going on. And the goal, at least initially, is to set a single price such that, you know, the amount of demand that requests a ride is equal to the amount of uh, cars that you have, the amount of drivers you have on the road. And um, so let's dig into this a little bit more. So how can we um, sort of, and you know, th th this is this should all you know kind of remind you about um, you know pricing with capacity constraints. 
but this is like just a like far more complicated version of pricing with capacity constraints because now it's like a real time constraint that also has sort of like time lag effects, right? So if I allocate a driver right now, then that means they're busy for the next 20, 30 minutes and they might not, you know, the trip might take them to a different neighborhood. And so, you know, your demand or your, your supply in that neighborhood is now permanently affected for the next few hours. Um, okay, so let's think about, um, let's dig into the sort of the goal a little bit more. So like, um, before we think about how to set prices, let's uh, maybe try to think about the goal of these prices more. So from the driver's perspective or from the platform's perspective, a trip has three parts. Um, first, there's the part where the driver has, you know, turned on the app or has finished their last ride and is waiting for the next uh, request to come in that they're dispatched for. So they're just like sitting around waiting for, uh, for a ride request to come in. And then once the ride request has come in, they have to drive some amount of time to get to, to pick up the rider because they're probably not going to be right next to them. And so there's, there's some time for pickup. And then there's the time for like the actual on-trip time, right? Like the, the amount of time that the rider is in the car. And from the platforms and driver's perspective, anything in which the rider is not in the car is wasted time, right? So the platform is not making any money for anything in which the rider is not in the car. And at least historically and generally, the driver is also not making any money for uh, whenever the rider is not in the car. And so you can think about like, you know, first cut a calculating efficiency of these marketplaces as trying to maximize um, the ratio of the on-trip time to the total time. And the goal of dynamic pricing is to try to do exact, or one of the goals is to try to do exactly that, is to um, regulate the level of open cars to make, to sort of to maximize this ratio. And this, I, I just want to point out that this is similar but not exactly to sort of like the standard revenue maximization that we covered sort of at the beginning of the pricing module. Because in the beginning of the pricing module, we said to maximize revenue, they care about price times sort of like the demand at that price. And here you can think, you know, it's not a perfect, this efficiency as like some, like something related to like, you know, like, like how much are they actually selling? How much like on trip time are they actually selling compared to overall time? And when I say that they want to maximize this efficiency, so sort of there's nothing about the prices at which they're selling, right? Like there's nothing here about um, profit maxim, like, like actually maximizing the revenue, it's just directly maximizing the efficiency. Okay, so what can go wrong if you sort of don't have dynamic pricing or you don't calculate this efficiency? Um, the big challenge is that things can really spiral out of control. And I'll give a case study in a few minutes. Can, things can really spiral out of control if like this balance gets bad. So what do I mean by that? So suppose you set prices too low. I, I actually don't know what this plot has to do with this description. But anyway, so let's suppose that you set prices too low. Oh, sorry, I know. So, so I think each of these each of these dot, yeah, each of these cars. So yeah, each of these like little things are as a car. And so that shows where a driver is located at any given time. Um, like an open driver who's like just waiting for a request is available at this given time. And then the red spots are where most of the demand is at that time. So yeah, so let's suppose prices are too low. Then you're gonna get a lot of requests from writers because, uh, yeah, so like just prices are low. And if you have more requests from, drive, from, from riders, then you're very quickly gonna match a lot of riders or drivers, right? So you're gonna sort of use up all your, your open drivers. And so what this map is gonna, this map is gonna thin with, with drivers, right? There's just gonna be far fewer dots on, the, uh, on this map. But if there's far fewer dots on the map, like think about a given, like the next rider 
who requests a trip and gets matched to a driver. If there's very few like dots or cars on this map, the closest car to the next rider who requests is going to be pretty far away from that rider, right? And so even so, you know, each driver is going to get a request very quickly, but the amount of time that it takes for them to dr to drive to the rider is going to be very long. And so then you, then you sort of sacrifice efficiency because now, even though there's so much demand, each driver is driving a very far distance to get to that demand. And this is what's called the wild goose chase in ride hailing marketplaces, where sort of like it, it's this like weird thing where like even though there's like a lot of demand on the map, if you do naive matching and you just sort of and there's too few drivers, drivers just have to drive a long distance to get to the rider that they're picking up. And then that's gonna snowball because now each trip is taking the driver more time. And so then there's gonna be fewer drivers like waiting to pick up new rides and sort of the system can get out of control. And so here, I'll just give like an example of this. And so this is from a case study published by Uber and a few others, or some Uber authors using Uber data and a few others in 2015. And so what they did was they compared um, two situations, one in which Surge worked as intended and one in which Surge sort of failed. Like by fail, I literally mean they had a bug in their code and like Surge stopped working for like 20, 30 minutes. And so um, the, first, the first claim is that, so th there was an Ariana Grande concert uh, in Madison Square Garden in 2015. And this is, um, a case where they claimed Surge worked well. So what happens at the end of a concert? At the end of a concert, a bunch of people leave the stadium and um, request trips very close to each other. And so demand suddenly spikes in that location in like a 15, 20 minute period. And ooh, this plot might be a little hard to read. So what this plot is showing, so the red line is the Surge sort of like how much um, like prices are compared to normal. And so like this line here would be prices are the same as normal. And then up to here would be like prices are 400% more. So like four are multiplied by four from a regular period of time. And then the blue dots here are um, how many people are actually requesting a ride at, at that price. And so what you see is you know the, the concert maybe finishes around 10:30 or so and a bunch of people would want to request rides so a lot of people leave the stadium and are like like staring at their phone looking um looking to request but sort of surge made things about four times more expensive than normal and so even though a lot of potential riders are there like the number of actual people who request is actually just like slightly more than, um, than like even like an average time when there's no, um, when there's like no demand shock. And so we can look at this in various graphs. So what this paper does is, so it looks at, you know, just like the amount of act, so this is the same as the, the, the blue in the last slide, just like the amount of requests over time during the surge period. And it's like, you know, so it does spike at first, right? So maybe this is a sign that um, their surge like kicked in too late. Like their surge wasn't able to predict that a bunch of people were gonna leave the concert. So actual requests did spike at first, but then surge kicked in and like very quickly requests went back to about normal. And because of that, when first requests spiked, it took a long time. It's exactly what I was saying a few slides ago. There, there weren't that many drivers near the stadium. And so it took a long time for drivers to get to the riders because like sort of there were too many riders requesting trips. And so you very quickly exhausted all the drivers who were near the stadium. And so it, so it took a long time for the average pickup to happen. Um, and then, you know, there's probably some like congestion effects here like traffic. Like, you know, there's sort of like Uber is creating its own traffic, but let's ignore that for now. Um, but then as 
as the number of actual requests goes down and like surge is operating sort of like like this this is what they claim the sign of a healthy marketplace that pickup times go back to normal so pickup times are you know between 1 and 2 minutes again or i actually don't know what the like ignore the scales and the y axis to like make things public they need to like you know not actually reveal what these like y axis numbers are so ignore ignore the actual no i actually don't know what these numbers mean um but yeah et so you know, like the time to pick up goes back down and y y you can't see it on this map but there's like a thin purple line just at the 100% mark here showing that um throughout this entire period even though there was a demand shock you know maybe hundreds or thousands of people requested trips right at the end of a concert outside the stadium they were able to complete every trip that was requested so yes there was a bunch of trips that they weren't able to complete because they weren't requested because the price was too high but amongst the things that were requested they were able to complete every trip did you have a question Um, great question. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, they try to be predictive. It's an extremely hard problem. Um, but yes, they, they, they at least try to be predictive, and it's it's an open question on how good they are at that. Yeah, so the, 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 the specific assumption there is the, the, the platform is still sort of like matching the, like matching the, or like it, it's like matching writers like in order that they press request. And so I'm some writer and I press request and I'm the next one in line. And so, you know, there's, there's some number of drivers in the universe and if there's a million drivers in the neighborhood next to me, there's a pretty high chance that the closest driver to me is right next to me. But if there's only one driver in the entire city, and like, you know, that, that, then you would have to make assumptions on like the distribution of where that driver could be and so on. But like, if there's like, if there's still only one driver in the city, odds are they're like not right next to me. Odds are they're like two neighborhoods away. Yeah, yeah. So fewer drivers and so less density. And so for any random writer, odds are the closest right the closest driver is farther away. And so so like what would like in this concert example, it would be like all the writers are like, you know, clustered right around the stadium. If there's fewer drivers, like right around the stadium, then the platform needs to bring in drivers from the surrounding neighborhoods. And so those drivers need to um, drive farther. Whereas if there were a bunch of drivers right around the stadium, then um, like pickup times would be low. Any questions about this? Does Uber inform drivers before a big event that, uh, hey, there might be a surge in demand, please go to this concert so people have a car available? Uh, that, that's a great question. I'm, I'm not sure what the, the current state is. But one can imagine that there's different levels of, okay, so, so I guess for that one is you need like the prediction to be fairly well, right? So as I'll get into in a little bit, um, they do show the real-time surge heat map to drivers. So like right now, where is the demand? Or like, or rather right now, where is like high surge, high payments? Um, the, there's a lot of challenges with, so, 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 so there's a lot of talk about, you know, like, you know, the claim that Uber could do something. Like, you know, it's intuitive that Uber could tell drivers, here's like the events in the city. You can imagine it being high. The, like a potential problem with doing that is if you're wrong, then like, it's like you maybe implicitly made a promise to drivers that like wasn't borne out. And sort of, but then the follow on to that is, like if you're right, and a lot of driver, and I'll get into this in a, um, in a few slides as well, even if you're right, and a lot of drivers end up going 
because they know the concert is going to sort of let out, then surge isn't going to happen because the whole point of surge is to balance supply and demand. And if there's already a lot of drivers there, then you don't need to surge. And so it's like a self-negating prophecy that could be you know, good for Uber, but maybe harmful for drivers. Um, but sort of all that being said, I don't know what they're doing in practice today. Is it viewed as a harm if you take a person to a location at one price and then they try to leave that location and then they maybe can't do so in order to like store something? That's like. But by, by person here, do you mean a writer or a driver? Yeah, a writer. Like if, if I want to go to some place in Connecticut, okay, I could easily get a driver maybe in New York City to take me. But then maybe I don't know as a writer that I'm not going to be able to leave that location. So like, is, is it built into like the algorithm or the platform to catch like bad sort of like a, a bad um, yeah, so okay. So 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 the question okay, so I, I need to keep remembering to repeat the question. So okay, so, so the question is is like certain locations are easier to get trips from than other locations, so like New York City versus like rural Connecticut. And um if if the platform is taking a rider from like an easy location to a harder location, is there like an implicit obligation on the rider on the platform's part to like help the rider come back? Um my so okay so from so my view here and based on at least like what what the platforms do publicly the it is not so much an obligation for writers right so it's like you know writers are like consumers they 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 can find another way back if like sort of if that's where they're going um they're because they they sort of chose to go there um from what is public the platform feels more of an obligation to drivers here. Because if the driver, if the platform sends a driver from, and I'll talk about this in a few slides, if the platform sends a driver from like, you know, Manhattan where it's surging to like rural Connecticut, like that's the platform sending that driver there. And if the driver has to come back without it, like, you know, without any trip, um, that's called deadheading. It's sort of like the, the driver is wasting their time. And um, th there's like conceivably more of an obligation on the platform's part to make it up to the driver um, for that deadheading. Um, yeah, so the question is, is, is there any personalized pricing built in? Um, I don't know in like this level, but I'll sort of, I'll talk in a few slides where like you could imagine that there, there could be some personalization going on. Yeah, but I, I don't know at these, like at this trip level, whether that's happening. When you said like the driver, like, yeah, so, so yeah, so I, I said, so the question is like, when I say make it up to the driver, what do I mean? Um, let me talk about that in a few slides. Um, and again, like, let me, let me just emphasize here, um, everything I'm saying here is from public sources and nothing I'm saying here is due to my internal knowledge of Uber. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So, so the claim here, um, on the writer side is that like, you know, surging on the writer side decreases the number of requests and like you have a healthy marketplace. This is surge working well. Okay, so what happens when surge doesn't work well? And so, you know, maybe conveniently for researchers, but maybe less conveniently for the platform, or, you know, people who are on Times Square on New Year's Eve 2014, maybe some of you were, but um, surge stopped working for 20 minutes um, right after the ball dropped. And it's like some technical bug that happened. And so, or not right after the ball dropped, about 1 a.m. So, so what, what this shows is like the, the surge multiplier, so how much more expensive trips were compared to average. 
um, over, you know, from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. on New Year's Eve or New Year's Eve and then New Year's Day. And so people, so, so Surge was like, was regular until people, you know, wanted to start leaving Times Square. And then it, it started spiking at 1 a.m. And then something happened, some technical glitch happened, and there was no surge for about 20 minutes, 20, 30 minutes. And so prices were just regular. Yeah, so from 1.24 a.m. to 1.50 a.m. And so what happened during this period? Um, you, and so the red period here is where they should have surged. So like in hindsight, like their algorithm should have had really high prices, but in practice, like in reality, it, it didn't. And so you, so you see requests just spike and not really come down until prices actually, right? So as soon as the bug finished, prices rose to about 5x um, regular. And so, yeah, so requests skyrocketed during this period, and then it didn't really come down until the period ended. But then um, sort of pickup times also skyrocketed to about six or seven minutes or, you know, whatever this, I don't know what this unit is, six or seven in this unknown unit. Um, and again, didn't come down until Surge started working again. And then they were only able to finish. So the completion rate also tanked. So instead of being able to serve 100% of the rides that were requested, they were only able to serve about 15% of the rides that were accepted, that were requested. And so this is sort of a, a, like a, a quite bad service in that you, you could think about the guarantee that the platform tries to give you is like if I press request and they take it, and like they take that request, um, they should eventually give you a ride. And they, they weren't able to do that. Yeah, so I think this is defined as like you pressed request, like they showed you a price, you pressed request, they said they were dispatching a car, and then they like they just never did. Or you know they were spinning to saying they were trying to find you a car, and they never found you a car. Yeah, so, and this is, yeah, so like in, in, in a 20 minute span, sort of, yeah, like the, the marketplace sort of like completely um, like tanked. And then it, you know, then it like slowly started recovering because, you know, sort of prices went up to 5X and then fell down. Okay. So any questions on sort of like why do surge? Do they have any data on customer or driver um, ratings during that time period or anything and see if it actually affected um, people's satisfaction on the platform? Um, so the question is, do they have like satisfaction data on like whether this has like long-term consequences? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Um, I don't think the paper, I don't think this case study talks about that. Um, you can imagine that's like, I mean, certainly this wouldn't be reflected in the, or it sort of, let's say I'm someone who did eventually get a ride. Then I would eventually, but it had a long pickup time. Then I would eventually give a rating and maybe it's like it is affected in the ratings. But probably um, it's more reflected in like more long-term consequences. Like, you know, you've learned that Uber is unreliable right after, like on New Year's coming out of Times Square, right? So it has maybe, maybe longer term consequences for like when you rely on the platform and when you don't. Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm about to talk about that right now, like how, how search works. Okay, so 
when the platform started, like about in 2011, like Surge was just literally some person responsible for the city with a drop down box of like, now I think Surge should be two. Now I think Surge should be one and a half. And this was, you know, for the entire city, it's, you know, whatever this person, you know, this person was staring at, potentially staring at a map of where the drivers and the writer, potential writers are, and just like deciding on their own when to search. And it was like citywide. Um, and then in 2013, um, they started slightly automating it, but again, it was like kind of custom as well, kind of manual. But now at least it wasn't citywide. It was like like per like chunk of the chunk of the city. And there was some starting automation. But then sort of in 2014, they started, and, and I think in 20, and I think this was again still real time. Like, like at this moment, how many writers and how many drivers there are. And that would have the phenomenon that you just talked about, where um, like before the platform realized there were fewer drivers, there that like demand spiking and there's about to be fewer drivers, like the first few people on that spike got lucky. Um, in 2014, they started doing uh, demand modeling. So they started trying to, again, incredibly hard problem. You, we, we talked about this in class. Um, but yeah, so, so they started trying to predict like in this, like in this area of the city over the next, whatever, five, 10 minutes, what's demand gonna be? And this is just like an incredibly hard problem. And like, you know, it's, it's like time series prediction. You have to like predict event, maybe have some information about external events. Um, but yeah, this is, this is just hard. And then um, starting in, you know, th this is like a slow evolution over time is th they started going from, you know, as demand modeling got better or, you know, at least in slightly better, um, they were able to go from, you know, d trying to model demand in this entire like region of the city to, you know, to closer blocks. And so now, or at least at the time that these slides were created, um, there's like a very fine spatial grid. Like this is like at the level of like a city block or like a few city blocks on um, like surge is like for the city block. And then, you know, of course, there's going to be some smoothness over space and some smoothness over time. And then again, at the time these slides were created, um, updated every two minutes. And what I want to point out here is on the writer side, like you want this to update basically as fast as possible, right? Like, like sort of you don't want a time lag of 10 minutes if a concert comes out or like, a, you know, a game ends and like a thousand people simultaneously request trips. Like you want Surge to react as close to real time as your engineering allows. Yeah, so the question is, is, has there been a push to expose this information to writers? And um, not directly, like actually expose these heat maps to writers like they do to drivers. But, and I'll talk about one of these products, actually maybe the next slide, I'm not sure. Um, but there's a lot of products that you could try to do that um, sort of tries to do exactly what you just said, which, you know, so earlier, I think last week we talked about um, price differentiation when you're selling multiple kinds of products, right? You're selling a high quality tier, like a first class ticket and an economy ticket. And so Uber Lyft could be selling like different tiers, like, you know, they're selling, do you want the trip now at a higher price or do you want the trip 10 minutes from now at a lower price? Or like you were suggesting, do you want the trip here at a higher price or walk two blocks at a lower price? And so before the pandemic, I don't know, in what cities, I mean, certainly this was there like in SF where I was, um, they had something, Uber had something called Express Pool, which, um, so 
again, before the pandemic, there was Uber Pool, which you know allows multiple customers to be riders to be in the same car. And so you know they're picked up potentially at different locations, but then driven together. And a big part of inefficiency in pool is these pickups, right? So like if, if a driver has to go out of their way to pick up a rider, then I mean one, I mean one that's like just wasting their time because that's like adding time to the route. But two, they're like annoying the other rider already in the car. And so um, Uber had something called Express Pool, which um, in a few you know, cities where density allowed this to happen, that um, essentially, you know, you saved a dollar or two or something, but then you were able to, like, they just asked you to walk to a place where the pickup would be convenient. So either walk to a place where maybe there's actually someone else you're pooling with is also going to walk to and you're both picked up together, or walk to a place where there's minimal, like, routing detours. And so, yeah, so that was certainly a product that was live. Um, of course, with the pandemic, pool has been stopped and Lyft's version has also been stopped for now. Okay, so uh, a few other potential aspects of rider side pricing. I'm not gonna really talk about this in detail. Um, so maybe the first one is um, a question of, do you, act, do you charge the rider for the time just that they're in the car? Or do you also t charge for the time that it takes to pick them up, right? Because the driver is spending, and we'll talk about driver payments in a little bit, but the driver is spending their time to pick, them, to pick you up. And so, you know, potentially the driver should be paid for that time. And so the question, if the driver is being paid for that time, should the rider pay for that time? Um, you could also think about personalized pricing. Um, now, again, I have no inside knowledge of how personalized, whether or how personalized pricing is done in ride hailing. But like from the outside, what one could imagine is, you know, these platforms send like coupons to customers all the time, right? Like for those of you who have the apps downloaded, I mean, certainly five, six years ago, less now that they have less VC money, but you would get like coupons like, oh, your next five rides are 20% off or something. And that's just being sent to each rider, you know, on their phone. The, the, that's a very easy, avenue. like if they wanted to, I have no idea if they do, if they wanted to, you could imagine that's a super easy avenue to personalize, right? So you could imagine that it's harder to personalize, like I request a trip A, you know, trip A from here to there. And like the person standing next to me is also requesting the same trip, you know, like maybe we're a friend group trying to just find rides. And like, you can imagine like, it's easy to get caught personalizing like individual trip prices, right? And you can imagine that causing frustration amongst riders. But uh, it's, it's one harder and also maybe less um, sort of less bad publicity if, you're just sending coupons to different writers, right? Because like, you know, coupons are making things cheaper. And as we, uh, as we saw in the last lecture, people tend to have less ethical complaints about uh, sort of charging more versus not giving a coupon. And so if they were doing this, which I don't know if they are, what would be the goal of this? You could think about you know, you want to convince riders who otherwise wouldn't ride to do a ride, right? You want to turn a non-ride into a ride. And so what this could be like customers who haven't ridden in a while or potentially new customers. And so, yeah, for a long time, all of these platforms had, you know, your first ride is $20 off or something. Um, grocery delivery services, for those of you who use them, still do those, still do that today, right? If you like you could probably get like a month or two worth of groceries for free if you just like service hop um, in New York, which y'all should do. <laughs> you know, every time moving to a new city, just like service hop these deliveries and get like a few months free. Okay. And so um, I just wanna 
point out one thing, that maybe the last thought on writer side pricing is, and I, some of the questions were pointing to this, is it's like, it's an open question right now to what extent is surge predictable? Um, and by predictable, I mean both in the like, in like the very short, like five minute span and in the like day ahead or two days ahead span. And to like, what extent is it purely random, right? Like, like real time, you have to like put up these prices right now. And that suggests a little bit about what kind of pricing you would want to do. So like um, a lot of the things that, you know, maybe y'all were asking about, you know, can you publish these, like, can you publish these heat maps ahead of time? So like people can plan their day and so on. Depends on the answer to this question of how predictable surge is. But then, of course, you're also falling into like the self-affirming or self-negating prophecies of like by by giving this information, the platform is of course um, influencing what surge ends up happening and like what demand ends up showing up. Are there any other questions here? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, that's hard. So, the, so like at this point, you know, in most cities, there's um, two dominant ride-hailing marketplaces, Lyft and Uber, or in the United States, Lyft and Uber. Um, in different countries, there's like you know different um, dominant marketplaces. Um, and certainly, customers and often drivers are doing what's called multi-homing, right? They're um, like, you know, checking prices on both apps and then customers are like, you know, ch choosing a ride from the cheaper app. And then drivers are potentially having two different phones, one logged into Uber, one logged into Lyft, and then just like taking whichever re request comes in first. Um, again, it's, it's, it's a hard problem to know how to do pricing with that like very real time competition. Cause like one, you might not know what the prices are that the other person is offering. And, and, and you know, y'all are gonna play with some around, you're gonna, y'all are gonna play around with this in the class competition. Um, and, you know, there also might be some like either legal or, you know, just like, like ethical, like PR challenges to like doing that, right? Like for example, if like Uber, I might be making this up. I forget if this was like, pub, like I forget if this actually happened, but like you could imagine if like the platform is, like the app is detecting for, you know, let, let's say the, the app was detecting that you also had the, like the Lyft app open on your phone. And then it gave you prices based on that, right? You, you could imagine that something, well, one, that's like encouraging people to now have both apps, which is like encouraging the exact opposite thing that Uber wants to do. And two is, you know, you can imagine there being uh, like people would not be happy with that. And like certainly on the driver side, right? If, if they were like favoring drivers who had the other app open and they were able to detect that. Or like the iPhone with my battery display is now at yeah. 3%. So he's likely to pay more for an Uber because his phone might die. Yeah, so, so one can imagine that that's like technically feasible, right? Like like the app can, like the app, app can request, in, like I, I don't know what permissions they request on Android and iPhone. And I don't know what data from your phone they can access without explicitly need to request that permission. But you could imagine that yes, they're able like technically able to do things like that. I don't know whether they do. And again, like sort of and, and this is like like an eternal 
sort of both internal and external, like, you know, that, that was part of the point of last lecture is that like, you could imagine there being like, like, a, like a public relations or fairness or ethical constraint around doing that. Um, yeah, but I, I don't know. But it's like kind of crazy that that's within like the realm of possibility. Yeah, so the question is, is um, sort of maybe not like hyper personalized, like how much battery you have left, but like, do they f like code in, like whether it's raining or seasons or things like, like weather? And you could imagine, and so like, I think that goes back to this like predictable or like purely stochastic thing, which is like, it's easy from like here to like intuitively say, like, of course, people are going to be requesting more Ubers when it's raining. But like, you know, maybe when it's a hurricane, no one's requesting Ubers. And so it might be hard to like hard code that in beforehand because it might not like sort of the, whether it actually increases or decreases demand might not be predictable. And so you might just be better off trying to do like purely like real time. Like right now, if a bunch of people are requesting or there's patterns that suggest they will be requesting in the next few minutes, then do surge that way. Yeah, so okay, so the question is, is like, how do you like trade off this like PR problem and the potential profit? I, I, I mean, ask like your MBA friends. Uh, uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, like, like clearly you could imagine that different companies play different strategies here, right? So like maybe they've abandoned this now and maybe most of you are too young for this, but like, six, seven years ago, or you have to like, even after like the whole like, you know, Uber sexual harassment um, scandals and things like that, Lyft was really trying to position, and you know, Lyft, its initial positioning was like, you know, we're the, they're the friendly ride hailing company. Um, you know, their thing is pink, they had mustaches, must, I can't say that word, mustaches in their cars, right? Like, like sort of they, their, it seemed like their, their PR strategy was like, they're gonna play as the ethical, friendly ride hailing company and try to get customers that way. Um, I would claim that at least publicly they've like maybe abandoned that more and you know, they're doing the exact, like, you know, they're contributing to like the same, you know, like, like against like the propositions in California and right, like, like sort of they're doing the exact same thing that Uber is doing for like a lot of like legal lawsuits and things like that. And so like certainly that's how like, different companies are playing different strategies here. I don't know how to, how to do that. Um, that's a great question. So I'm about to get to the driver side now. So like they do show the heat map to the drivers and yeah, so let me jump to that. Are there any other questions here before I jump to that? Yeah, so the, the question is, is um, like, you know, how much can you shift the onus on the, like, you know, maybe turn this into like an auction type system where like instead of posting a price, they, um, you know, like they, they ask writers how much they're willing to pay and then like allocate it to the highest. I think that's like a, like here you have to like now trade off potential gains to just like that being a bad user interface. Um, like like the, 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 the analogy might be, that for the most part for like new goods, like Amazon has beat out eBay, right? So 
like it turns out that people for like most of their goods don't actually want to like bid in an auction and potentially lose and like having to keep monitor right there's there's delays in that like you have to have a bidding period of a week where like amazon can deliver today or tomorrow right and so um and like if, if an ebay as you might have noticed they've like shifted a lot um, from like the auction format to like buy now. And so, um, yeah, I, I would say that that's just like a user interface challenge. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the driver side since, oh, okay, actually one more thing before I move on to the driver side. And so, yeah, so earlier I was talking about um, Uber Express Pool where like, you know, they, they make it cheaper if you, draw, if you walk a few blocks um, to make the pickup easier. Um, Lyft, uh, at least again in some cities, so this was true in San Francisco last year, or, um, they, they launched what's called wait and save, which um, you can request now, but say, you know, I'm willing to get a ride anytime in the next 15 minutes or something, and then you save like a dollar. And so if you're not in a hurry, you know, you're fine waiting at your place, then um, you can get cheaper and sort of like the motivation for that. So this is from the slides from a friend who's at MIT and Lyft is this, the slide is given. So the X axis is the price like compared to normal. And so this is like a one X normal and this is four X normal. And the Y axis is how long people wait between the time they open the app and see the price and they press request. And what the different percentiles are, like the 25th percentile is like, you know, the peop, like the 25th percentile of how quick, like, how, like if you sort people by how quickly they press request, then this is the 25th percentile line, this is the 50th percentile, this is the 75th percentile. And so what this is showing is as price increases, there's like a bunch of people, you know, like rich people who like are just gonna press request anyway. Right, like they're not gonna wait longer for prices to come down. But then like, you know, maybe like the, the master students who are paying a lot of money for tuition are like waiting um, a long time for like prices to potentially go down if they see an expensive price on Lyft. And so um, this is an example of, uh, you know, maybe you don't wanna do personalized prices for whether you know, someone's a student or someone's making the big bucks as a professor, uh, no, I'm the medium bucks. Um, Y'all after graduating will be the 25th percentile. Um, yeah, so you, maybe you don't wanna like price differentiate based on like who they are, but you want to, um, you know, what we talked li last time is, is like let people sort into their own buckets um, by, by offering uh, services at different tiers. And so they launched something called wait and save, which you're offered a cheap, so you're, you're just offered, you know, you can get a car now, or you can get a car in 15 minutes and you'll, you'll save some money. And so let people self-select into which one they are. Okay. And so I don't think I have too much time here. I was gonna do the, show the, the questions related to Uber and Lyft from, yes, from the last lecture. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, I'll just skip it, they're on, online. Okay, so I do, I do wanna briefly talk about driver side payments since there's been a bunch of questions about driver side. So, um, so far we focused on rider side prices, but in these online marketplaces, especially ride hailing, there's a counter to prices, which is, you can call it wages, you could call it commissions, you can call it payments, like money that you're paying to drivers. And, you know, that's also an algorithm, like algorithmic payments is also like something you have to think about. And it's, it's very like it's sort of, there's very similar principles to algorith algorithmic pricing. So like, this is what I worked on when I was at Uber. And the, in some sense, you have far more responsibility to the drivers. So like this came up in a few questions, right? So like, like drivers are people who are, you know, making their, like their livings on the platform. And so like it's, 
it's like almost fine if there's a bug on the writer side, right? Like the worst case is like, you know, someone doesn't get a ride from A to B um, or like has to pay more than otherwise. But if you, if you do experimentation with payments, if you sort of have bugs on the payment side, then like that's like messing with um, like how people make money. And so, okay, so, so with that, so historically in ride hailing, drivers are paid per trip. So historically that means they earn a fixed percentage of what the rider paid for each trip, right? So it's like classic supply demand curve. There's the same, there's some price the rider is paying, the driver gets that price minus Uber's cut. And again, generally and historically, they do not earn money when they're online, but not on a trip. So when they're waiting for a trip. And that's because there's no direct customer who's paying for that time. And again, yeah, so also historically, they do not earn money while driving to the customer. And, you know, the, there's a lot of justifications. Um, maybe the more, most fundamental one is they want to align driver incentives so that the driver is making money when the platform is making money. And so that the driver has like, you know, and like if the driver actually responds to information about where surge is and so on. Right, if the driver is making the same amount of money with someone in the car and someone not in the car, then they might not act in ways that like makes them more likely someone's going to be in their car. Yeah, and so the goal is to incentivize drivers to drive when and where there are more riders. And there's two ways drivers can respond to prices. Um, the first one is what times of day and where in the city do they begin driving, right? So like when and where do I turn on the app and start driving? And then during the shift, do you relocate from one part of the city to another, right? So like no one's in my car, I'm in you know, a neighborhood where there's no rides, do I like start driving without anyone in my car back to Manhattan? And so I just want to uh, like, you know, do like, you know, give like some inkling of some of the challenges here. So we talked about on, on the writer side, you want surge to be as like real time as possible as your engineering allows, right? Like you want, you want writer prices to like respond to demand right this second. And let's suppose, you know, like these companies did historically, you just, whatever the writer surge was, you, you mimic that on the driver side for how much they're earning. Then like, let's take the driver's perspective. And what this heat map shows, what, what this um, GIF shows is the, the change in surge in LA over a one hour period. So this is, this is just a one hour period. And you can see surge is updating quite quickly. And like, at least to like my eye, I, it's like unpredictable where it's gonna happen and where things are gonna start and end. And so if you're a driver in like one part of the city, you see on the real time heat map that it's surging somewhere else, it's gonna be natural to ask, is it still gonna be surging by the time I actually get there? Right, so if this is how fast it's updating. And you know, the answer is probably no. That, and like drivers recognize this, like you know, new drivers make the mistake of chasing surge. But then like experienced drivers know that like chasing surge is not how they maximize their money because by the time they get there, surge is probably over. But then that's a problem to the platform, right? They're, the whole point of them showing surge to their drivers is to convince them to, to drive to that location so they pick up the more passengers that are there. But if you're updating surge in real time, for drivers just like you are for riders, then like they're going to be incentivized to not chase search. So there's like your incentive is actually not working because it's not good for drivers. And so what's the fundamental challenge here is that riders respond to prices quickly, right? Like I open the app, I see a price, I request or don't. Drivers have like a natural delay because of spatial frictions, right? Like, if it like, 
physically takes me 10 minutes to drive somewhere, like there's, like, there's nothing I can do about that. That like that's 10 minutes. Or if I already have a writer in my car, I need to finish the trip and then I need to go to where Surge is. Like sort of there's like nothing the driver can do. You can't teleport. Like there's just a friction in due to time and space. And so drivers are responding to prices slowly. And so on the writer side, you want to update Surge as like as fast as your engineering allows. But if you do that, then the driver side is not going to work. But if you don't do that, then you struggle on the writer side because you don't rate, raise prices until 10, 15 minutes into you know, the concert letting out. And so um, what I worked on when I was there is sort of switching over to the platform doing what's called decoupled pricing, which means they have some payment to the writer or some, some payment that the writer is paying. And there's another payment that the driver is getting paid, but these like heat maps are updating at different time scales. And like at least like, and, and this is something that um, sort of like, like, you know, the claim that Uber and, and you know, at this point Lyft also does the same thing. The claim they make publicly is that on average, riders and drivers or drivers are still earning the fixed percentage of like the total pot that writers are paying into, but it may not be true at the triple level anymore. And sort of with, with this caveat, I mean, I, I do want to caveat, of course, that like there's um, a lot of like, you know, ethical challenges and, and, you know, like legitimate criticism of like how Uber and Lyft and ride hailing companies and other freelancing companies sort of treat their like, you know, driver employee or not employees, the driver independent contractors. I'm happy to talk about all of those things offline. Um, sort of what I want to point out here is there's a mix of what I view as like just like fundamental challenges due to like physics, like, you know, like, like these spatial frictions that might lead to certain designs. And then there's like a whole host of things that the companies are doing or not doing because it like it, it affects their bottom line. And um, yeah, so I mean, you know, I, I certainly believe in a lot of the criticisms about the latter, but oftentimes sort of, it, it's like mixing the former and the latter of like things to do because of physics is I think what leads to, you know, potentially like bad criticism, I mean, or legitimate criticisms coming from a place that like, or, you know, coming from a legitimate place that ends up being less helpful. But yeah, no, certainly believe a lot of these, you know, like why can't you make them employee or like, you know, offer health insurance or things like that. Okay. Okay, so yeah, so, so this is one challenge is surge and, um, yeah, so, so surge, you wanna do the, almost the opposite thing for riders and drivers. And so because of that, they ended up decoupling prices. And then the second challenge, which also relates to something y'all talked, about, uh, something y'all asked about, um, is destination pricing. So earlier we've talked about um, higher prices in pickup locations that are busy, right? So like that's what surge is for 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 riders. For the driver, the destination also matters, right? If the next trip is somewhere where they're not going to get another request for a long time. That, hurt, that hurts their future earnings for that shift. And so like, this is uh, an image. Uh, so, sorry, I should have had another slide credit here. This is also from Hamid from Uber. Um, so this is an image from Uber where um, this is like some guess at the platform trying to calculate what this future valuation is for drivers over the next hour or two. So, Again, certain parts of SF are like highly valuable for drivers to end up in, but then you know the, the suburbs like Berkeley, Oakland are less valuable than a driver if that's where they end up. And so if a trip is taking a driver from like a valuable location to a location that on average is less valuable over the next two hours, then you know, I actually don't know the current state of what the platform is doing, but um, you can imagine that like a right thing to do would be to compensate the, the driver for doing that. 
and then the question is is okay yeah so so you know first is the question of do you compensate the driver but then the second question is do you charge the writer more right so do i charge the if i'm paying the driver more from going from the middle of of sf to berkeley do i charge the writer more for taking the driver from the middle of sf to berkeley and this becomes really thorny really quickly because this might be illegal right so um destination discrimination is like illegal for taxis right so like you know legally a taxi can't ask you where you're going and then deny you a trip based on where you're going and the reason the driver the taxi driver might want to do that is exactly this reason right the taxi driver is not getting paid any more for being taken to berkeley than they are if they're being taken to sf and but like you know being taken to berkeley affects how much money they're going to earn the rest of the day and so the taxi driver doesn't want to take you to berkeley because they don't like you know that affects their livelihood and you know the legally um, cities have often decided that this sort of destination discrimination is illegal that taxis and ride hailing companies are providing a service that needs to be accessible to everyone especially you know especially those from historically um, sort of like socioeconomically not privileged neighborhoods and so have made destination pricing or like destination discrimination illegal and so maybe some sort of destination discrimination is fine right like if you're charging more so there, there, there's a neighborhood that i lived right next to as a grad student in atherton which is the richest zip you know that's where a lot of the tech billionaires live it's like and like atherton's also a suburb and like maybe it's fine to charge people more to be taken to atherton but it's not fine to charge people more to be taken to like historically poorer neighborhoods um legally and so then this becomes a thorny question of like how do i compensate the driver for something that affects their livelihoods without um running up against like discriminating by destination for the writer okay i just have like two more minutes so a few other like interesting tidbits from ride hailing um this is really interesting paper that finds so there's a bunch of uber authors and some external economists that finds that there's a gender pay gap for drivers and ride hailing that on average men and uh, tend to earn about 7% more per hour than um women do on ride hailing and that's like weird in the sense that presumably uber isn't actually paying drivers based on gender right they're not actually paying they're not personalizing prices and just paying more on like a gender covariate presumably um so what this paper ends up finding is that there's like a, the 7% gap can be explained on the platform and by um sort of experience on the platform so for a variety of reasons you know some, some certainly under uber control um women tend to like churn more but you know like tend to not stay on the platform for as long time as drivers maybe after bad experiences from riders and experienced drivers end up earning more and experienced drivers end up being disproportionately men um there's some like preferences and constraints on where they want to work so uh, maybe like certain neighborhoods women don't want to drive because of safety concerns or other preferences um and then driving speed so men tend to just drive faster and so that i think that explained 50% of the 50% of the 7% is just like speed um i'm going to skip this after you know uh, uh this is maybe the last thing i'll say and so another interesting sort of peep thing that people ask is like can uber just increase the earnings of drivers right so if uber wanted to today can they just make sure drivers earn more money and like the answer in some sense is obviously yes right like you can just like increase drivers pay per trip right so where there's some time and distance rate that drivers are being paid if you just increase that your um sort of dr drivers will earn more per trip what this paper pointed out is that there's longer term effects that end up making their overall earnings the same if you do this so what they what what this paper looked at um again uber economists and a few others 
is that let's suppose you increase per trip payments. And because of that, driver, uh, driver earnings overall increase. That makes driving for Uber a more valuable proposition versus like alternative jobs that you might do. And because of that, more drivers join the platform or drivers increase the amount of time they're driving on the platform. But if there's more drivers, they spend more of their time waiting for a trip. So that ETR I talked about and less time actually on a trip. And so their overall earnings um, sort of degrades back to normal. And so if the, if the platform wants to increase average driver trips, this paper makes the claim that they need to restrict who can join the platform or how long, how long different people can drive. Okay, so I think that's all I had for today. Um, maybe I'll do like a quick summary of the module next time. Um, many of the things that we covered in this module are gonna be used in the class project. So sort of, I repeat that Wednesday uh, or Friday just does office hours. Um, certainly even if you, know, you didn't do a lot of homework three in time, so on, um, I would sort of suggest that you go to office hours and maybe think about you know, catching up on the material or like thinking about how to extend the material for the class project. Um, a lot more I can say about algorithmic fairness and other topics in pricing. Um, I'll send out a survey at some point about what topics to cover near the end of class, um, like near the end of the semester when like we have a few slack days.